Imagine there's a, there's a, that great Louis McNeese poem as well, where the, the bus journey, oh, yeah. uh, the bus journey ends at yeah. the at the Thames, right. and the and the and the ferryman brings it. That's you know. one of the great ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to die, you have to pay. You have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking. I mean, I, there, there is there is a great um, continuity in 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 your books, in your in, in your work. I mean, a great sense of all of all your work fitting into a kind of a continuum of form and feeling. Again, I'm, for instance, in, in, in Human Chain, there, there are poems of intense memory um, of, of parents of earlier life, but there's, a, there's that sense of overlapping time zones. You know, you have now and you have in illo temporary kind of, you, you have the poems often use a kind of remembering present tense. Um, you know, who, who is this coming to the ash pit? Who is this not much higher um, than the cattle? Um, it's as if, it's as if the membrane between past and present is so thin that, that they constantly um, leak into each other. Um, I, can, I, I, think, I can think of few poets for whom memory seems to be such a releasing or, 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 or triggering force for you. Um, is well, memory is, has been essential to me. Without uh, a, little, a little memory trigger of some kind, I usually can't get started. Mm. And uh, it hopefully leads to something else or something more elaborate or something that wants meaning. I mean, I, th I suppose everybody in their life had those moments when something memorable occurs that you remember forever orphaned in a little patch of light and it has significance. <clears throat> and you don't quite know what it's all about. <clears throat> well, I, I, that's the kind of thing I trust to get started on. But <clears throat> I suppose after 50 years of it, there was those numbers, a number of little scenes dwindle. <laughs> and, you know, you use a good few of them up yourself. <clears throat> but, but undoubtedly, uh, I mean, it, take Gilvik. I mean, actually, that, that poem of his, it's like memories of, all, probably memories of all of us, you know, as childhood, close to the, uh, close to the ground, close to the uh, plants, close to the vegetation. Um, but undoubtedly, yeah, even uh, there's a poems in uh, Wintering Out, well, place name poems. Well, place names really were a walk into memory too. Yeah. Uh, and I think that. The first time <clears throat> I really wrote about the present tense of my life was when we went to County Wicklow and we were living in new circumstances, refreshed, and uh, that I could actually risk, <laughs> risk what was there uh, and get it into something. And Dan Moore Sonnets and uh, yeah. love poems and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I'm, th I'm thinking. I mean, I mean, I, I, um, the, for instance, the pull, the, the pull of uh, Moss Bawn, say, in in, 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 in in book after book, and how the materiality of it. I mean, because you, you, you go you go back to the physical world. Uh, you go back to physical implements. The you know the the machinery, the the baler, the turnip snedder, the harrow pin, the anvil. This this kind of huge. You know this kind of hard physical kind of material world that, that, that pulls you back all the time. I remember Benedict Kiley being asked some sort of question about his background and him saying, I shouldn't be in a folk museum, I am a folk museum. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, there is an element of that, uh, definitely. <clears throat> but that's where the memory goes, you see. And I wonder. You know, I suppose that there's other elements, I suppose, as well. I mean, I, I wonder is it because I mean, I mean, I mean, the place you remember is is is, it's not a kind of serene pastoral uh, world. I mean, it's a, it's a disputed and fought over kind of place. I mean, again, a recent poem like the Wood Road, um, resurfaced, n never widened, a road where things happen, and you have the bee special with his gun, you have the hunger striker's wake, you have the stain where the child was was knocked down. Um, so you have, you know, it's, 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 it's a troubled kind of place often uh, as well. Yeah, well, 
the, the, the troubles were part of it. The, the troubling. Yeah. It was a troubling of the spirit, definitely, for yeah. every raider from the territory, yeah. I think, and from all over Ireland. I think. Yeah. Uh, and that certainly was... Uh, I mean, that brought you to the present in a different kind of way. In fact, there, there were elegies in uh, field work which were immediately responding to friends who had been uh, killed, you know. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, and the great thing about those was that, I mean, I, I had, we had moved into Dublin at that stage and I thought we had made a wrong move uh, for my writing because I thought I'd never be able to feel at home here uh, the way I felt at home in, in the house in Wicklow for writing. And uh, that summer I sat down and just gritted my teeth and said, come on, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> got, got out, uh, I started to rhyme at the thing and uh, Will, Will did the work of imagination for a while and then it got moving again. So that, 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 uh, that was important, that uh, just sit down and push it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, well, since it was about, again, elegy, uh, it was a one way of responding to the whole thing, yeah. the grief. Yeah. Uh, I mean, your, your world, I mean, the, the, the world of, of your poems is, is in, in, in one sense, it's a highly personal kind of world, and, and your language is an instantly recognizable, almost um, poetic um, idiolect. But, but the poems that you write aren't, um, they're not personal in the sense of, of confessional. Uh, they're embedded in, but they're kind of pushing out from your own life story in a way. And I, w I was wondering, do you, think, do you think poetry has to do that, uh, um, to drive towards the impersonal? I was thinking, you were writing once about Robert Lowell and, 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 and whom, whom, whom people, um, think of a kind of touchstone of, 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 of the personal, but you were, you were praising that kind of drive towards the impersonal, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to think that uh, yeah, it's it, impersonal is the ideal, at least changed a bit, you know? Come, yeah. come, the thing, uh, to feel it has come through a bit. But I, I used to, with students in writing classes, uh, very primitive distinction, but the distinction between, say, a love poem and a love letter, or a letter of sympathy and, a, and a, an elegy. I mean, one is meant to sustain the gaze of the outsider, uh, and one is meant entirely for the single, the single gaze. Uh, so I think that uh, if you get a poem that, that feels uh, more like a poem than, than a letter or a confession. You're in business. And it's very hard to know exactly how to do that, you know. Uh, to be finished. Uh, to if, if, if you feel that the thing is finished, it may well have uh, become a little bit more tran transcended or transformed. You know? But it's a mystery how to know when when it is finished. Do you, 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 you know the old kind of chestnut, that the, the, the Paul Valerie thing about poems never being so, you know, finished but, but abandoned? I mean, do you have that sense of kind of closure or With a few, abandon them, uh, with a few but no, on the whole, uh, I, I, if they're finished, they're finished. And good or bad, as they say, mm. uh, we just have to live with them after that. What, what, what are the things that, it's a, it's a different question, but what are the things that, 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 that matter to you as you keep going, uh, as, you, as you continue to write? I mean, or how do you keep going, as, 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 as it were? How do you keep going as a writer? Well, uh, to misquote Michael Loney, if I knew that, I would go there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said if he, knew, if he knew where poetry was, he would go, he would go. there. <clears throat> uh, well, waiting has always been part of the game, I think, yeah. and trusting, and <clears throat> and hoping, uh, and translating, yeah. <laughs> as good as any. <clears throat> but um, yeah, you, it's hard to uh, it's hard to get away from your own themes, as it were. <clears throat> what what you, what you want to do, I think, is to put another twist on them, you know. Yeah. 
And uh, that's quite often how uh, a, a new book comes into view, that uh, you write a poem and you don't really know where it belongs, and then you say, well, it doesn't belong in this book, it belongs in the next book. So it was a kind of a, a little tuning fork that you need for, for uh, the second one. I almost, I almost hesitate to mention the, the, the P word, um, but the pleasure. This, we, we're, all, we're all fairly, or we will be all fairly well bludgeoned by pleasure by the end of the um, <laughs> conference. But, but I wonder. I mean, because of the theme of the of the of the festival is 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 pleasure, and and there is this quotation on on the on the brochure. Uh, you know, for Seneca, whoever manages to tap into himself is per se an object of pleasure. And I wonder. I mean, what? What do you think is the relationship between poetry and pleasure? William Wordsworth said <clears throat> that the great primary principle was pleasure. Uh, I mean, there are many as a student who feel that wasn't fulfilled by reading Tintern Abbey, but that, <clears throat> that's a different matter. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think doing it is a pleasure. And there's two different, I mean, speaking of different stages or ages, I think when, when you're starting out and younger and going at it for the first time, you go at it for the high of a finish, you know? Yeah. You're kind of sprinting and pressing the tape at the end. <sighs> there it is. And uh, thank God I've got another poem. <coughs> the, uh, the older I get, the more pleasure I get in doing it. Uh, you know, the actual composition actually uh, having having awakened yourself and keeping yourself awake by by writing so that uh, that's one definite uh, change in the pleasuring <coughs> but i think if, if there's not some pleasure in it well is is there also the, the, a sense of of almost a, a Pleasure is an assertion of the independence of. I mean, I, again, I, I'm thinking of that quotation from from Wordsworth. I mean, the grand elementary pleasure of principle. You quoted that once in an essay where you yeah. where, where there were quite kind, kind of dark um, themes. Uh, you were talking about Marlowe and Spencer and Raleigh in a context of um, the dark deeds of empire in 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 a way. And you're, there's, a, there's a kind of reminder of um, the kind of independence of of poetry from. Yeah some of the pressures that are applied to it or? Yeah, I was kind of resisting in that, a, a, yeah. too, a too political reading yeah. of Marlowe, say. Yeah. Which, yeah. I mean, I could I see it could happen. Mm -hmm. A very imperial uh, blank verse drama, <clears throat> which you could link to the English expansionism mm -hmm. in the age of Elizabeth, if you wanted. But, you know, <laughs> it's a way, it, it's fine, but mm. it, it, Somehow it's not the, the thing itself, you know, uh, but it's a way of reading it mm -hmm. that's fashionable. No. Do you, just moving, I'm moving away from that a bit. Uh, do, as a poet, I mean, it, um, poets often envy the what they imagine as the kind of uh, the continuous um, imaginative life of, of, say, the fiction writer who goes into the the room and sits down every day and and, and completes a stage in a in an ongoing work. I mean, does a poet live from poem to poem, kind of uh, hand to mouth, or from some sort of assured continuity? Well, from hand to mouth, uh, which more or less gives assurance. But but I think it's an interesting thing. When 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 do you? In other words, when do you allow yourself to be called a poet? Uh, when you when you've written sufficient poems, or when you have changed <laughs> in some way, uh, taken 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 it on, given yourself into it, and so on. I, I think it 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 varies with uh, different people. I I would uh, date my own uh, poet life as opposed to poem life or book life from 1972, when leaving, walking off from a perfectly good job and going down to work full time. Uh, so at that stage, I, I took it on myself as a, as you say, kind of a, uh, a readiness to credit poet as a description. 
but um, but in fact, within that, th there's always the anxiety from poem to poem. Yeah. In this case, not in all cases, I don't think. Oh, yeah. No, no. I would, I would. Uh, well, I, a lot of poets are are like that. I think f live from poem to poem, mouth to mouth, hand to mouth. Hand to, yeah. yeah. I was wondering. I mean, um, you're, you're sort of, you, you have professed poetry. Um, you, you know, you, you have been a professor of, of, of poetry in the sense of being involved in, in, in education. Um, you have, you know, you've written many lectures. Um, you've written a lot of prose about um, poetry. Is that, so, is that is that is that important, or has and, and has being involved in education been important? Well, it's been important in that uh, I. I uh, when I got a first job in the university, I had no secondary degree. I had a BA, and uh, I was anxious uh, about it, and I hadn't done my thesis, etc. Mm. So I, the professor said to me, "Don't worry, write a few essays about uh, about poetry now and again." So, so that's what I that's what I did, uh, and uh, it seemed to suffice. Uh, and I got into the habit, really, of doing lectures, public lectures, making me, unless I took them on, I tended not to do enough work, you know. Mm. So, but also, the the essays, or the beginning, in the beginning, certainly, the um, things were related to uh, to my own work, insofar as they didn't solve problems, but they clarified things for me. There were ways of clarifying mm. an approach. Um, I wrote a, uh, an early essay on uh, Jared Manley Hopkins called The Fire in the Flint, which is from Shakespeare's Time of Athens, a little quotation. And he, he draws a distinction between the fire in the flint, uh, which has to be struck out, and what he calls our gentle flame, the flame of poetry, which oozes, he says, uh, from... So, so, so there, are two, there are two, there's the hard strike out and the gentle e emission or whatever. So that, that, that I felt uh, in my own things early on, there were quatrain poems that rhymed and there were more uh, heavy free verse things. Uh, and the same was true of, uh, I mean, I, talked, I did a thing about Yeats and Wordsworth, Yeats being hammered out and, you know, ring, 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 ring the anvil. On, and uh, Wordsworth, much different. Flow the river, you know. In a recent interview, um, you, you did 15 um, Oxford lectures over, over five years, and you said that in the course of them, um, you were determined that there wasn't going to be um, a single joke in, 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 in any of those lectures. You didn't want to be cast in some kind of Arnoldian stereotype. I, was that possibility of, of being stereotyped something that you were always aware of? Or, or, or? Uh, no, it, that was very particularly in that role as professor of poetry. Uh, I thought that, to go back to what we were talking about, the, the theatrical presentation of the poem, yourself and the poem, I thought that if uh, I, my personality uh, got into the way well, as, as freely as telling a joke, I would be uh, blotting out the wisdom of my lectures. You know? <laughs> no, but but being I didn't want to be too charming on on stage. You know, and uh, is, charm is charm dangerous? It's uh, useful. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm aware of I'm aware of time. Um, so I, 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 I but I had to, there are a couple of other just. Maybe a couple of, of, of other questions um, before we open it up to, to the floor. Um, I don't know if anybody followed, um, you know, the the, the recent f uh, fuss about about uh, Gunter Grass and, and and his his uh, recent poem, which result he wrote he wrote a poem um, about uh, Israel and, and nuclear power and and. He became. It resulted in him being declared a, a, a persona non grata in in, in, in Israel. Uh, I know this is, a, this is a kind of variant of, the, of, of a question. I'm sure you've been asked many times. But is, is there a role for poetry? Do you think at 
at that level of um, engagement or, or not? Well, I think there's certainly a role for the poet if he or she chooses uh, to enter that realm. Um, and obviously, th there's a kind of moral obligation one feels at times. But, but it never quite works out. I mean, the, the, one of the great cases is the case of Mandelstam being hounded for a, an epigram, uh, they call it the, the Stalin epigram, yeah. which was uh, an intervention, uh, but it was you know, betrayed to the authorities. But it's not, it's not one of his typical poems, apparently. You know, it's, uh, yeah. On the other hand, if you think of uh, Allen Ginsberg, who changed the game considerably uh, with a poem like Howl, uh, you, you can see that kind of prophetic writer, that, that there is a possibility there for, for moving the world, actually. I mean, I, I think during the Vietnam War, uh, Allen Ginsberg was like an alternative American foreign policy. Uh, he, he, uh, yeah, he, he let the world know that there, was, there were other ways of responding, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll, just, I'll ask a final question uh, and, and um, after, and, and you might just read a couple of poems af, af, after that, and we might allow a couple of questions then um, to, to finish with. Well, my final question was, as you get older, is it, is it harder to surprise yourself? Definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the, surprising yourself is, is the actual, uh, uh, you know, it's the clue to getting some work done. Yeah. Self-surprise. Uh, I know that's a good one. <laughs> uh, waiting for it, I think. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, maybe I mean, I mean, um, we, we, we might end at the, there, there is a poem, one of the many um, uh, marvelous poems in Human Chain is, is uh, Miracle. Um, and I, I might ask you to read that, and, and I think you also had a, a new uh, poem. So we might um, sort of end this part, um, and we might take after that, um, just two or three, two or three questions, perhaps. Miracle. Not the one who takes up his bed and walks, but the ones who have known him all along and carry him in, their shoulders numb, they ache and stoop, deep locked in their backs, the stretcher handles slippery with sweat, and no let up until he's strapped on tight, made tiltable, and raised to the tiled roof, then lowered for healing. Be mindful of them as they stand and wait for the burn of the paid out ropes to cool, their slight lightheadedness and incredulity to pass those ones who have known him all along. And I wrote, I wrote a contradictory poem to that, which is, uh, I mean, I don't know, it, it has, as its hero, Oshin, you know, who, remember, who, who went away to the, oh, the wrong thing, uh, went away to the land of eternal youth, and then he came back to Ireland, and he was he was told uh, not to put his foot on the ground or things would end up bad for him. I thought I had it with me. I thought I had it with me. I'm sorry. Okay, no. Um, maybe, um, can, I, can I thank you first of all um, for, um, for your you. generosity? <laughs> and I don't know if there might be, um, a, there were questions, yeah, perhaps. Thank you, James, for all this time for the wait. But um, two very quick questions, which is actually quite good. The question is in your life, uh, you have mentioned Oshin there recently. Did you have more encounter or pleasure out of the gods of 
Greece and Rome, like Zeus or uh, Hermes, than those of Banba, like Dagda, Dan, uh, Mananon, Matlir. And the second question is uh, a, a man who decided to go to the underworld 96 years ago, deliberately, on Pirsach. It was said of him that he wrote prose poetry. I wonder, uh, could you define, or from your point of view, the nature of what he was about, prose or poetry, or a bit of both. And the cadetta is the humble nettle is also contains, when you turn it into tea, uh, the elixir of life. <laughs> what did you say? Uh, well, I think, uh, of course, the gods of the classical Mediterranean world, or the stories of that, do turn up more in my own work. I think it's because, maybe, while, while uh, you, I, I love that material of the, the heritage, Murray has done a book of the legends, of heritage legends, I think they have been, you know, they were occupied, that's territory that has been conquered and occupied before by uh, WB and several people, you know? So uh, that meant, I think, that I wasn't as ready to go there. Uh, the Pauli Pierce, I suppose, is visionary poetry, but it has the, the, I mean, it has the idea of, of the gospel almost built into it, the Messiah complex, if you like. Uh, and uh, there's an interesting book just about to appear uh, by the Peruvian novelist uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, and he's writing about uh, uh, he's writing about Roger Casement mostly, and Casement's uh, contacts come into it, and Pierce comes into it as a as a visionary. You know, uh, I haven't read the poetry in a long time, but uh, uh, it's it's certainly loaded towards <laughs> propaganda. <laughs> Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for such an enjoyable moment. Uh, my question is as follow. Um, at a time where social media grow more and more into our social, personal lives with a lot of um, you know, self-centered, instant expression, do you think it's getting easier or harder for poetry to find its way to today's and tomorrow's generation? Well, I just don't know. I, I, th I believe in the transmission, as we have talked about, of uh, readings face to face. I, I would find it, because of my just habits for a lifetime, difficult to read poems the first time on a screen, you know. I, I want them in hard copy, uh, and but but it, it has happened for generations of people now, and the little ones in primary school are completely into reading uh, texts, and uh, so it's it's. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if poetry just integrates itself into that. You know, uh, it it has its own attractions and its. Its, its audience, after all, is a self-selecting audience, even even here and now, or there and then. Uh, and uh, so I, I think, yeah, maybe maybe it won't be taught in the same way. I don't know. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of poetry life in a culture, I think, does depend upon the schooling that people receive, and. Uh, that's a, a contested area too, what you do, what, what is your syllabus going to be uh, at early age and at secondary age and so on, and indeed at third level now because the idea of, as I say, a periodic reading of literature is kind of old fashioned entirely. It's, it's gone nearly. Yeah. So you can go to a university and do a degree in literature, English literature, and not necessarily do very much poetry. Uh, things, things have been bad before. <laughs> yeah. 
last one. Final question, if there is, if there is somebody, yeah. James, I wonder how you feel about the translations of your poetry. Have you ever felt that a poem had been betrayed by a translation or that value had been added? Um, 